Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm so excited to be here and I'm really happy that I get to kick off because I know you are all caffeinated and probably the most engaged you're going to be throughout the day. So I'm going to try not to blow it and make it worth your while. Um, so like you just heard, I'm Jamie DeLang. Um, I'm currently a VP of product at Slack and I also run our self-serve business for any of you who have bought Slack with a credit card, um, I'm responsible for making sure that you understand how to use it and can get it up and running without any support from our sales team. But this is all pretty new to me. I actually started out my career working in product in search and machine learning products, first at Etsy and then at Slack. So when we're talking about AI today, know that I'm coming from this like machine learning background, very traditional sort of AI, if you will, um, and bring a lot of that context to the conversation. So <clears throat> what are we going to talk about? AI. Everyone's excited about it. Product School is excited about it. You're probably being asked by somebody in your company or will be asked by somebody in your company how you can leverage AI in your products to make them more competitive, to make them better, to make them sort of fit for this future. So we're all going through this mega revolution. There are a lot of ways to do that. Some of them are good, and some of them are not so good. And we're going to talk through um, all of that here today. So like I mentioned, I started off working in machine learning. I have a lot of experience building really not so great AI product, products. Um, first, starting at Etsy, you know, I, I felt like kind of the world was our oyster. We had all of these buyers, all of these sellers, so many items on Etsy, and so many user interactions that we could play with. So working in search there, you had a lot of ways to inflect, right? We could take all of the information that all of our users were giving us every day about what they clicked on, what they clicked on next, what they added to their cart. We could build taste profiles. That was really exciting. Um, we had all the information that sellers were giving us about their listing, the keywords, the photos, how many times someone had uh, clicked on it or viewed it. All of those things put together helped us to match people with the things that they might be looking for but didn't know how to express. So machine learning was really, really critical to the search problems there. And I, I became kind of in love with machine learning and search problems. Um, I, I studied English literature in college and thinking about what people um, mean when they say a specific word or what they're thinking about when they try to express a specific concept and meeting that in the moment was really, really exciting to me. But eventually, uh, you know, I wanted to grow my career. I got kind of bored of working in e-commerce, and I thought, you know what would be great is applying this in a completely different domain, work chat. Um, so I got to Slack. I was bright-eyed. I was bushy-tailed. We were going to do so many great things with machine learning. We were going to build amazing summarization features. We were going to connect you to experts in your organization. We were going to help you focus on what was most important to you and not focus on anything else. Get rid of all the noise in Slack. So how many of you use Slack here? And how many of you would say we've gotten rid of all of the noise in Slack? Probably no one. <laughs> so we had really, really high ambitions, right? But the technology just wasn't there yet. There were lots of barriers in our way. Traditional machine learning techniques didn't really work well to solve these kinds of problems. For one, all of the data that Slack has is customer data. It's not our data, which means that we have to work with it in a very, very different way than the way I was able to work with data at Etsy. Second of all, it's all words. It's not you know, listings and images. It's, it's real text. So we thought you know, what will be really great is we'll use natural language processing which is the traditional way of dealing with language and machine learning. We talked to all these companies, we reviewed all kinds of models, and no one could deal with the unstructured kind of chat that we were working with at the time. We tried to do the traditional sort of methods we were using at Etsy, where we looked at things like clicks and how many views something got. Maybe that tells us if it's important. And then we ended up just telling you, like, the most important picture in, in your Slack today is your coworker's dog, you know? So, we, we, we built a lot, a lot of things, but technology just wasn't there yet. Fast forward to today, and 
Slack is actually able to solve most of the problems that we just talked about with large language models and generative AI. So I think like as we're talking through sort of how you can use AI in your products, I want to just seed in your mind that there are probably problems in your product that are evergreen problems that maybe you've been trying to figure out how to solve for a really, really long time. And the technology just hasn't been there yet. The problems aren't new. Our ability to address them is. And just, just keep that in your mind as, as we're going through stuff. All right. So quickly, uh, there's going to be some forward-looking statements in here. I'm talking about Slack. Don't use anything I say to make any financial decisions. That's it. Um, <laughs> all right. So I, I don't need to tell you guys all this, but we are experiencing one of the biggest technology shifts in our industry, uh, in, in our careers, and that's generative AI. Um, AI is it's everywhere. It's in reach for every company now. We have a few very large uh, incumbents, already incumbents, within like a year in this space, who have made their models generally available to pretty much anyone. So that means that just off the shelf, you can get a really, really powerful AI model without having to have machine learning experts inside of your company. That's totally new. That's totally different. And it's driving a whole new sort of ecosystem inside of tech. There's massive shifts in funding. AI startups are being funded at an incredible rate, and it's not slowing down. We're seeing in the enterprise, every company is trying to figure out what their AI strategy is, which vendors they're going to work with, which products they're going to buy, because the market is quickly becoming very saturated. This is not slowing down, but it's also not necessarily going to lead to you know, every single AI product being successful. In fact, we have evidence that this is the opposite of true. According to Forbes, 95% of all AI products are going to fail. So we know that most products don't succeed, but I think 95 is a fail rate that most of us wouldn't be happy about. How do we think about building that 5% of products that are going to work? So before we get into what to do, sometimes I think it's fun to just talk about what we shouldn't do. Um, how many of you have bought an appliance sometime in the past, like, three-ish years? Did it come with an app? <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, I, I remember pre-COVID, the Internet of Things was, like, what everyone was talking about. We were going to put chips in everything. Everything was going to talk to everything. Everything was going to be location-aware. Your entire house would run itself like the Jetsons. That was the future we were all headed toward. And along the way, we picked up some really beautiful products. So not just the app that I had to install with my grill and my dishwasher and my washing machine and my refrigerator and my coffee machine, um, but also you've got this really beautiful um, salt shaker that can uh, stream music and has mood lighting. Um, you can see here there's an egg carton that will remotely tell you the freshness of your eggs, which is usually important when you're not near your refrigerator. Uh, and then finally, there's a toaster that, as opposed to, you know, your normal toaster that just pops when the toast is done, it'll buzz your phone. So when you're out and about with toast at home, you know what's going on. <laughs> So you could kind of see the fallacy here, right? Internet of Things was so cool. Everybody wanted to do it. Everybody had to have an Internet of Things strategy. And what does that lead to? Honestly, a lot of bloat. And, and we even saw during COVID that some of the you know, advanced technology in some of these uh, appliances actually made them much more difficult to produce. So you're adding in a dependency where you don't really need it. You're not actually solving anything for your user. You're just kind of jumping on a hype train. There could be a lot of pressure to do this, but my advice to all of you is don't. What are you going to do instead? So here's how I think about it. I really think that solving problems with AI is just like solving any other kind of product problem. It all has to start with your users. 
So first, think about what your users need. Once you've got that in mind, think about what the intersection of those user needs are and what the technology sets you up to be able to solve today. The scope of solvable problems is so much larger than it was even a year and a half ago. So it's really, I think this is, this is the fun part. You get to open your imagination to think about how those intractable problems might be solved in a new way. And then finally, consider commodification. We're all using very, very similar generative AI models. Um, some of the features that they have kind of out of the box, like a, a chat interface that can do question and answer on open web uh, content, everybody can have that. Just like everybody can have an app that sends you a push notification. So think about ways in which you can use AI to differentiate your product, to add additional value in a way that only you can. All right. So how do we do this at Slack? So I already told you about how I royally screwed up so many of the ML features that we were trying to build because the technology just wasn't there. So we already knew that there were really long-standing problems for people using Slack. There's a lot of noise. There's way too much content. There's a ton of value potentially in all of the messages that are happening in Slack, but it can be really difficult to parse, really hard to keep up especially if you're in a fast-moving company or a large company where there are a lot of messages happening all of the time. We want Slack to make your working life simpler, more pleasant, and more productive. Checking Slack shouldn't feel like a chore. So we already had a good sense of those user problems. The next question was, how can we use AI to solve those problems? So one of the things that we, we really took to heart here, as I mentioned at the beginning, our customer data is our customer data. So in the past, when we were talking with vendors, we had a lot of challenges around, how are we actually going to deploy one of these third-party models? So our team took a lot of extra time and care in thinking about exactly how we would host those models and keep everything inside of our own environment to make AI safe for our customers. So there wasn't just you know, how can we add value, but how can we ensure trust and security? We also wanted to make sure that we were leveraging our unique moat, which is both, both sort of our Achilles heel and our value, is that there's so much going on inside of Slack. So we did have this really rich data source. And instead of thinking about how we could do things in the open web, we thought about how we could do things as Slack. So all this meant took a little bit more time to go to market than maybe it would have if we had just sort of thrown a chat interface in where you could talk to any AI but it also meant that we were able to provide differentiated value. So let's get into it. What were our principles as we thought about what we were building? The first thing we thought of was that, like Slack is for everyone, our AI should be for everyone. So again, a lot of folks um, are taking an AI strategy that involves a small set of people working with the AI to provide value for the entire organization. Sometimes that makes sense. It might make sense in your organization. But for us and for our product, it didn't make sense. So we took a, an approach of no prompt engineers. No one should have to figure out how to work with an AI. The AI should be adapting to them and how they work. We know that some of our early adopters are going to be OK with tinkering with a new piece of technology. But if, if late, late adopters are having a hard time figuring out how to use Slack, Figuring out how to use an AI inside of Slack is like graduate level PhD stuff. No one's going to do that. So we wanted to make sure it worked for everyone. Next up, it needs to be trustworthy. So I talked about this a little bit before, but many AI tools out of the box rely on public data from the public web. You don't necessarily know how these models are being trained. You don't know where the answers are coming from. You don't know if they're hallucinating. Um, and inside of a work context, that is not really the quality bar that we need to meet, right? We need to make sure that when we're giving you an answer to a question, we can stand behind that answer. We're not causing you to make a poor business decision. So we decided to prioritize not only using our data, but having citations back to the source material for that data. So in Slack, we have uh, a few features. There's first uh, question and answer inside a search. 
So you type a search query, we formulate that into a question, we give you an answer. We have channel summaries and thread summaries. So let's say you've been out uh, getting your toast and a bunch of people continued on your thread. You can go back, click a button, and get a quick summary of the thread and pick up the conversation without having to read the whole scroll back. Um, and we also have recaps, which allow you to sort of condense a lot of the channels that you don't read all the time into summaries or digests so that you can catch up really quickly. All of those features kind of take raw work data and turn it into a summary, right? Something that AI made itself. And if you've played with any of these LLMs, you, can, you know that sometimes they infer things that aren't real based on that data. Sometimes they imagine things, or maybe they might attribute the wrong thing to the wrong person. So we want to make sure that you had a way back into the source material so that you could ensure that what you were reading was reality without having to go find it somewhere else. We also took a lot of care and time in our infrastructure to make sure that all of the data stayed within our environment. That meant working closely with our partners, working closely with our cloud vendor to make sure that everything that Slack was offering was provided by Slack, controlled by Slack, and nothing was going back to the sort of core models, back to the open web environment of these LMs, which is really important for our customers. So finally, it needs to do meaningful work for the user. And it has to be worth the user's time to learn it. So I mentioned we don't want to have people have to get a PhD in AI at Slack. It's a lot of work to figure out how to use a new technology. And most of the time, you're just trying to get your job done. But even something as simple as figuring out how to use a summarization button or having to figure out how to rewrite your search query in a new way, that's actual work for you during your work day. In order for that to be worth your while, you have to have a payoff, right? You're not just going to go click on buttons all day long inside of whatever your work tool is. You're not there for fun. You're there to get a job done. So we wanted to make sure that this was delivering real value for the user. What did this look like for us? Um, it meant that we spent a lot of time in both an internal beta, using it as Slack, using it as part of Salesforce's ecosystem. And then we also spent a lot of time in a beta with our customers. And in each of those beta instances, we were able to get feedback on the quality of the answers that we were providing or the summaries we were providing and use that to fine tune our deployment of the model. So we do a lot of pre-processing of the data. We help the LLM understand what's happening with the data in Slack, whether that's like interpreting your query perhaps, or you know, helping it understand what a message is. We wanted to make sure that the models were actually providing value, not just sort of slapping a little sparkly uh, smarts logo on it. So we had a quality bar that we had to meet before we felt good about going out to a wider audience. This is a real challenge uh, for AI and machine learning products because once you get it out to everyone, you get a lot more data. So you have to be very careful about where you set that bar. Uh, but for us, uh, measuring and maintaining that internally was a key part of the rollout. All right, so just to quick put a bow on all of this, AI product development is very similar to products development. I would say, first, you have to anchor in genuine user needs, not just shiny tech. Your AI efforts, just like any effort you do, it needs to solve real problems for your users. Don't get distracted by the latest AI trends or buzzwords. Understand the underlying pain points first. So this probably means that just putting a button that calls out to you know, an Anthropic model, or an OpenAI model, or a Google model, or an open source model, it's probably not going to be the thing for you. Uh, anybody can do that, and there's probably no reason for them to come to you uh, to see that. So that's first of all, real problems for your real users. Second of all, think beyond the surface trends uh, and start to think about how this might enable real innovation for you. These models are extremely powerful, and we're just figuring out what they can actually do for us. 
Um, we've talked a lot about text, but there's also generative AI in the image space. There's generative AI videos. These things can do a lot. Um, there's probably something that your users have been trying to do for a long time that you haven't been able to meet for them. Maybe that's something like, uh, you know, I think Canva is doing really cool work here with the cold start problem and template generation, taking it to the next level. There's a lot of interesting work happening um, in, in creative spaces generally. So I think like, think about your industry, think about the applications you've seen and how that might work in your product. As you're thinking about that, also think about differentiated value. You don't wanna do just exactly what your competitor is doing. You probably have something to offer that they don't. Think about how you can add value for your users in a way that makes sense for your company. And finally, this is all transformative technology. It's changing a lot. We're moving very, very quickly. It seems like every week there's a new like, model or a new product on the street, but there's also a new uh, concern. There's a new issue, right, in terms of trust. Whether that's I think Scarlett Johansson is mad at OpenAI this week because they're using her voice, uh, but it's not her voice, it's an AI voice. Uh, there's one of these new sort of like, oops, somebody did it wrong every week. So you wanna not be that person, right? Think about how you can build trust into your product from the start and make sure that, you know, we won't know where all of sort of the, the landmines are out there, but make sure that you're avoiding at least the known hazards. And finally, I, I think like for all of this, the costs here, whether it's reputational cost, building cost, actual cost of deploying these models, um, which aren't free, the costs are real. So think about how you can make sure that this is worth the return on investment, not just for your business, but for your users as well. All right, I think that that is it. Thank you guys so much.